I think the interesting thing is you have to work out where your true value lies. And if you're trying to protect something that isn't real value, then you're just being protectionist. Episode 101. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I travel to the West Country where I go to Stroud, I go to Gloucester, and I visit the Miller Howard Workshop, uh, where I'm speaking with Dr. Thomas Yarrow, the anthropologist who you may remember from our previous episode about his book, Architects, Portraits of a Practice. And I'm speaking with Thomas Miller, who is the director at Miller Howard Workshop. And it was a really good and fascinating afternoon that I spent with both of them because I wanted to talk with Thomas Miller so I split this podcast up into two parts and the first part is me talking with Thomas um, about the growth of Miller Howard Workshop how they've incorporated very innovative technology into the very craft-based approach that they have to architecture, how they've been very innovative in the way that they price their services, how they communicate with their clients. And then the second part of this podcast um, is Thomas, Dr. Thomas Yarrow joins us as well, and we discuss the impact of having the anthropological ethnographic study done in the office and the way that it's actually changed the uh, functioning of the office or the reflections or some of the conclusions that were drawn from that. And and Dr. Thomas Yarra also joins us for the first part of the conversation as well. Um, and it's a very lovely relationship between both Tom and Tom. Um, they've known each other for a a very long period of time. They're working together. Uh, they've done this study together, uh, and it and it was a really interesting and multi-perspective way of looking at both their practices and the kind of. I think it gives us a lot of insight into some of the the business operations and a chance to celebrate uh, those aspects of architecture and the daily functions that we do. That sometimes we get are overlooked. So sit back and relax and enjoy the first part of Dr. Thomas Yarrow and Thomas Miller. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. We've got Thomas and Thomas, Dr. Thomas Yarrow and Thomas Miller and Tom Tom M. You are the one of the co-founders of the uh, Miller Howard Workshop, whose beautiful offices we're in this Thank afternoon. You. And Thomas, you are the author of uh, Portraits of a Practice. We've spoken before on the show, um, and. Tom's practice was the practice that you actually studied. Um, and so we'll be talking about that in, in a little bit. But to begin with, um, I'm quite keen to speak to you and focus on this kind of story behind your practice, how it began and the sort of the DNA of it, if you like. So let's just start there. When, when did you begin? How did the company come about? Yeah, so uh, well, in interesting. I actually, I actually failed my final year um, at the Bartlett. And uh, to retake it, I came back to Gloucestershire and um, was living with my parents. Just, I only had to do a couple more months to retake the year. 
Um, and my business partner Tom had also moved back to build a tree house in his garden uh, or in his parents' garden. And um, so while I was retaking uh, the course, he said, well, Why don't you come along and help out? That, and, um, I've met so many really good architects who have failed their final year at, at college. Was there something that happened there that kind of, like, I'm quite interested actually, yeah, just to, just to know what was that like and did that kind of give you an extra amount of gusto or like... I think it's interesting. I mean, it was horrific at the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Watching everyone go off on holiday yeah. and kind of you thinking, actually, I've got to go through all of this again. Um, yeah, it was terrible. Um, but actually, I, I suppose in hindsight, it actually made me do something different. Mm. Because otherwise, uh, maybe I might have just drifted into working for a bigger practice in London. As it was, I moved back from London, back to Gloucestershire, mm. and yeah, started building tree houses. Amazing. Um, which was which was really exciting. And we actually, we had me and Tom had worked a little bit before in our year out together, um, and we. We just, I think, I think one day we were driving along in 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 a, in a van, having picked up some wood, um, and we just looked at each other and it was kind of like, why, why don't we make a thing of this? Like, like why don't we make this what we do? And, and yeah, and so from um, from building tree houses, we went on to building extensions. Um, we tended to do kind of garden rooms and uh, extensions and tree house type structures in Gloucestershire in the summer, and then we did flat renovations um, in London during the winter, and so we had this kind of lifestyle between the city and the country and it was fantastic it was great and and, and the, those early projects a lot of them you were actually involved in the construction and manufacture yourselves you were yeah so fully hands-on doing everything plumbing electrics carpentry um yeah all, all of that and it was i think people really connected with it clients really really connected with it this idea of someone doing both the design and construction mm. and especially on a small project where actually spending time doing design it's difficult to justify the amount of time that you'd need for that for a smaller project whereas actually if you're doing the construction as well then that design time can kind of be happening whilst you're building mm. so very few drawings kind of drawing on the walls of the site and um, yeah no it was an amazing time and really really energetic and I really I, I really miss it actually still it's kind of a how, how did how did that begin to evolve into a practice and did you end up working in other places um as well to uh, to learn the craft that way or did you go kind of straight into uh well i, I it's interesting I, i'd actually written my dissertation um about the uh collins diy manual and so i was quite interested in this idea of uh, kind of this uh, DIY knowledge and mm. also got into boat build like the idea of boat building and some of the techniques um, of that and so was this I, the one that failed uh, no. <laughs> no I did quite well in my dissertation oh, right. <laughs> maybe I spent too much time reading the DIY manual <laughs> and um, yeah so, um, so, so yeah so bringing those things bringing those things through I don't remember the question, sorry. Yeah, how, how did the, those kind of early projects, how did it begin to evolve into what we have now? Well, so I think we, I mean, it was, it was a bit of a roller coaster those first few years because we'd be building a project and then someone would come and see it mm. and ask about it. It seemed exciting and then ask us to work on their project and we were just moving from project to project um, and getting through projects quite quickly because they were quite small in scale. Yeah. Um, and so we actually started to grow a construction business quite quickly that was working. We were just kind of earning more than our friends who were in architecture practices. And so it was, it was a really good time. Um, I think we started to be so that we were spending a lot of our time just ordering materials, managing other people, um, and all the difficulties, I suppose, of being a builder and a contractor. Mm. Um, but which actually has since given me a real respect for contractors and builders and how complex that job is. Those early kind of experiments or projects uh, when you're involved in the construction, and also you were telling me earlier about your upbringing in, in Canada where you were involved in the kind of, around those lots of those kind of incredible handcrafted homes. How has that been a kind of foundation for you to 
be more experimental or to in, engage in more other entrepreneurial ventures in within the construction industry or how's how, what's the relationship there well I, th- I think it was interesting i mean i th- think we were talking earlier about um i spent some time in an island in canada yep. which i first went to when i was five returned when i was eight and these were these amazing houses built out of driftwood and there were kind of bedrooms that were on roofs kind of in these amazing shaped rooms and houses looking out over trees and I was a bit worried that when I went back, having studied a few years of architecture, that I'd somehow see these as lesser buildings. Mm. So it's really interesting to go back and actually fall in love with them even more and realise that you didn't need... You could do... You could create buildings in different ways and these were buildings that didn't have any architects involved in them and yet they were fabulous, which was kind of interesting having just (laughs) invested a whole lot of time learning (laughs) to become an architect. Um, and then when I came back, I actually, uh, Thomas's parents um, commissioned me very kindly to build a small deck um, outside their house. This was actually before me and Tom, before the tree houses. Um, and I th- suppose I took that passion for what I saw of people making their own uh, structures and had a go at that <laughs> uh, at, at Thomas's parents' house and kind of really, really enjoyed it. And that. Thing of making something that's bigger than yourself was kind of was yeah was really exciting and, and so you, you two have, all, have had a very long relationship in terms of like you know thomas you've seen your friend kind of grow through this all the, the various stages mm. of gestation of an architect even you know working with him on projects or having working in in uh, you know with, with family projects which yeah. is which is a nice uh, it's a very rare relationship in many ways yeah um, i mean i think it's always been a friendship that's had quite a um not necessarily a project focus but a making focus of an activity focus so i mean i guess that's um something that's more generally true is the way that building or making makes also relationships and mm. so i think that's always been a big part of um the, the deck and, and various other kind of projects along the way but yeah certainly i think one thing i found interesting is seeing this sort of trajectory from outside and um, you know the the kind of doubts and the anxieties about what was the next stage because what was the next stage and you tell the story backwards and you know that that failure was going to be the stepping stone to learning something but at the time it doesn't doesn't necessarily feel mm. that way so I mean that's interesting um, and yeah um, it's, uh, it, it was then in, but it's then also interesting how when I came to do the research. Um, how different as well it was in a way, you know. The, I think that's something I find interesting is how private people's working lives are in a way. Even people you know quite well. Mm. We talked a lot about his architecture, his work, but actually kind of seeing the daily reality of it up close and what it involved was really, uh, really interesting to me. Um, how did the practice start to evolve in terms of its relationship with technology? Mm. Yeah, well. Uh, I, yeah, I was just thinking back to your earlier question, and because I, th- I, th- I think the thing that I really, um, the thing that I really found in those early days, was when we explained our business model, all we had to do is say we are architects who also build, and the person I was speaking to, whether that was a wedding or a party or a client, they'd then finish why finish my sentence of why that was good. Mm. So they go, oh, that's so good because architects don't know how to build somehow I've got this reputation of not knowing how to build um, which I'd obviously deeply question but um, so but so people people would explain why it was good and so it's amazing seeing that idea almost go viral with enthusiasm from kind of family and friends mm. like, yeah this seems like a really good thing to be doing um, having got a big bogged down in all the kind of ordering materials and things we then i then decided to go and get my part three right and then eventually we came back together again to set up a more formal architecture practice right but i think what that gave me in those early days is showing that if you do something differently and have a narrative behind that the strength of that narrative that people can then tap into Mm. and understand and get behind and i've always kind of felt a little bit like um traditional architecture practice is a bit kind of constrained and it's quite difficult to differentiate yourself from any other practice or or even kind of non-architects kind of just 
people who draw plans and yeah um, and so I think we've always had an interest in trying to find out where how we can differentiate ourselves or do things differently or how can we change the business model mm. having got a taste for that in those very early days and so I suppose the technology aspect I mean my my dad designed computer chips when I was younger and got very in I got very kind of I had a computer very early on so I've always kind of been mm. very at ease with technology and I think it, I think it was actually about six years ago we had a business coach and she came in and she'd kind of seen me kind of playing around with I think I had a VR headset at the time and I was very much doing it in my spare time and saw it as a bit of a distraction. Mm. She sort of pointed out and said, hey, actually, look, this is this is the stuff you're really passionate about. And it seems to be really relevant to your business. Um, why don't you why don't you take that more seriously and bring that into what you do? And I was like, can I do that? Because that's my passion. And like, mm. <laughs> that's, I, I mean, related that's to that, I was wondering also, because um, you've obviously had this like interest in craft and, and, and the physicality of it and making. Um, but also you've got this interest in computers and coding and I suppose from the outside those might seem quite different things and even in tension we tend to think of like craft as the antithesis of like the virtual and the but um, yeah I was wondering how you saw that relationship between the kind of I guess the more physical crafty elements of what you do and and that you do we'll probably talk about this a bit later but you, you you use computers so in so many ways. Yeah. Well, I think that's what was interest, interesting about reading your book. And I think, and some of the ideas in there of this idea of things that are intention. And I do, I, I do quite like that. So I think uh, that technology and the craft on the face of it are opposites, mm. but that gives a lot of potential to explore how they can come together. Um, but in a way that's not always obvious, and, in, and because it's not obvious, it's interesting. Can you, can you give some examples of how you're utilising technolo- technology in the delivery of projects and also in the kind of running of your, your business? Yeah, uh, I mean, w- one of the things, quite in some ways quite a simple thing that we've really got into is this idea of photogrammetry. So this is where you... Um, this technique's fairly, fairly recent because you need an, an, a huge amount of processing power in order to... Uh, use it but you basically feed in about 300 photos into the computer um, and uh, the computer then processes that using a really high-end graphics card so you get these graphics cards that are used for kind of very high-end gaming and you feed these photos through a program Fo- a program's called meta shape um, costs about 200 quid so it's kind of, kind of quite cheap and it basically turns those photos into a point cloud and then into a textured 3d model right what this is really good for is you can go to a client on the first visit. At the end of the meeting, just go around taking 300 images, which you don't, they don't have to be anything special, so you can do it in five, ten minutes. Feed it into the computer that evening. Go home, go to sleep, come back the next morning, and the computer's got a 3D model of the site kind of that it's developed. It's almost like uh, developing a photo used to be in a dark room. Right. Kind of like it emerges. And so you're making, a, you're making a sort of image of the site, like one of those kind of sort of David Hockney type of photo stitch images, and then it kind of builds a 3D model from, yeah. from that visual image. But it can be a kind of almost like a millimetre accurate model. Wow. Which we can then bring into some 3D software and then we can start manipulating that and putting in proposals. Um, so we found this really good for two things. One is being able to respond after an initial visit with a client. So when we send the fee proposal back, we actually send them back a 3D model with a very rough proposal in it that might have only taken kind of half an hour to kind of produce and we send them back a YouTube video um, showing showing what we're proposing um, so that's one thing that's really benefited the other is for listed buildings right. it's fantastic for kind of capturing a complex stone wall or something because you've then got every mortar joint and every stone and you can really work out how your intervention is going to interact with that in a way that was very difficult without it and you were also showing me earlier some of the kind of uh, practice management pieces of software and actually not only going beyond just utilizing practice management software but you're starting to craft your own ways of using it and using technology to develop bespoke 
you know, kind of like meta apps, if you like, that kind of control how various bits of software are communicating. Could you talk us a little, a little bit about the, the things that you found that you needed to kind of computerize, let's call it, uh, most immediately, or the things that this has been quite powerful in? Yeah, I think it's, well, I think the kind of technology industry in general is kind of just spewing out enormous amounts of programs and applications and um, and there are also a lot of these applications are creating APIs which are ways of connecting to two applications together um, and so I think in the in the past there have been some some like really dominant big software programs like you know the Adobe and like Autodesk and things and you, you have a program that you have to do things their way mm. But I think there is a bit of a trend for people kind of almost bespoking their own software. I mean, I suppose a very simple case of that is Grasshopper and Rhino and people using that as a design tool and connecting things in different ways. Um, but we've started doing that in some of our um, pro internal processes as ways of gathering data. So there's a, a great program called Airtable that's kind of crossed between a spreadsheet and a database. Um, it's kind of one of those free things that it's free for a certain number of records. And, but we found it really great for collecting all of our different data that we use in the practice. And then another program called Integromat that we can use to connect that through to something like Slack. So we've kind of created a chat bot where it's basically an assistant for an architect where you can access our databases through a chat bot, um, a Slack chat bot. So you're literally like typing in a question and you're getting a, is it an artificial intelligence um, response or the response? There's a degree of artificial intelligence to it. So I, I, actually the, the chatbot side of it's handled uh, by something called Dialogflow that's uh, made by Google. Right. And um, it had a degree of intelligence, but they actually, because all of this stuff's kind of real cutting edge, um, Google, have, they just released an update about a month ago where you can feed in a 300-page PDF into wow. Dialogflow. It will then kind of consume that and try and work out what it's saying. And then you can ask it questions about what's in that document, and it will send you back answers. And so, so, and so this, is, is this technology that you've only used internally, so it's not something that you necessarily you make accessible to clients to kind of engage with you through a chatbot or anything like that. It's more... Well, I suppose I, I, I kind of think that create, uh, technology is kind of best when it's... Well, I think you can use it as a creative tool. Yeah. And I'm really excited about that idea of yeah. it being something that you can... You don't just kind of use in the way that it says, but you can manipulate and change to suit your needs. Um, I was thinking of, um, I, I don't know if there's a, a great paper by Masumi um, on it, it making the argument that the digital is, we tend to conflate the digital and the virtual, but actually they're often um, inversely in relation. So the more that we have the digital, it makes everything kind of compatible all on the surface. And actually the virtual is that possibility that we have between two things that are in, in tension, in incompatibilities. It's that imaginative space that we have to mm. construct between, and that's in a way. So, you know, analog is full of virtual possibility of things that, you know, resist each other on, in any easy relationship. But I was thinking when you were talking us through earlier today all the different kinds of software and the way you're bringing those together into this really kind of interesting um, ecosystem. I mean, I don't understand the kind of details of it all, but like it, that seems like a really kind of exciting. A, a way of, of kind of cannibalizing of not being a passive user of these kind of global corporations but actually of being you know making them work in a really architectural way it seems like a really kind of exciting well I, and I think a lot of people can find technology um, alienating mm. or kind of either they don't they don't have they find it something to resist or a bit sort of skeptical of it mm. actually especially data I've been having a lot of conversations about data recently got quite into data actually partly from that book uh, book that thomas recommended called all data are local yeah. can't what, can you remember the author's name can't i don't think so but um it's the, the concept is that all, all data is both produced in a local context and then consumed in a local 
context as right. well. And so, but there's a tendency to treat it as something very abstract. But actually, we have to remember that it always relates to something very local, mm. which again is one of those ideas of two, this idea of data and local, which you'd normally kind of feel were maybe opposites. Or, uh, and, and is this kind of um, relationship, how, would it, how does it impact the, 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 the buildings? How does, it, how does it manifest itself into, in terms of like productivity and, like, and the team? How does it work in as a, growing a business culture? I'm not, if I'm really honest, I'm not totally sure. <laughs> um, I, I mean, there have been some, we got into VR about five years ago, mm. and that's really revolutionised the way we work. The thing I'm really excited about that is it's made us be able to get closer to our clients. So our clients can now have a more, a closer relationship to understanding the building. Because mm. before they were having to interpret that through plans or a kind of 2D a 2D representation of the building whereas now they can put the headset on and they can be in the in the building itself yeah and so the technology is kind of interesting and is fun but the thing that's kind of game changing is how it changes your relationship with the client yeah so we I suppose we're always looking for these things that actually although they they have a kind of manifestation in the tech world or they're based on a technology. The thing that they actually improve is a real world. Is a real world improvement. So I suppose the photogrammetry helping on a listed building is a good example of that too. Yeah. It's kind of so. E- generally, they're either bringing us closer to the building process or closer to the clients. Right. And, but you're not always sure which ones are going to do that, <laughs> and so you have to kind of sort through quite a lot of stuff that doesn't do that. And, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you, we were discussing earlier about how you structure your your fees? Um, and I was I was quite excited to see how you've developed a kind of a price banding scheme. How did that come about? Was that was that kind of something that was led by technological innovations or practical innovations or a business self help? Business <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, no, well, yeah, I think I was saying earlier that uh, someone, one of the employees came along and said, like, you know, I, I want to learn more about project management. And I realised that I hadn't, it's not something I'd formally studied myself and I didn't really have the answers about mm. where to go or theories or felt a bit embarrassed, really, kind of running a practice. That, and um, So I went on a bit of a hunt for that information and through that discovered various different kind of books and got really into some of those kind of different ideas. Um, and I think through... Uh, and a, a lot of what's been interesting about that is looking at other disciplines and other business models and how they work. And in nearly every other kind of business, they seem to ha- have this idea of the banding mm. um, is kind of central and providing different uh, service levels. So say in a supermarket, having a value range and a your standard range and then the kind of best buy or whatever it is yeah there. and so I thought well why don't we try applying that to our architecture um and i since doing that i've heard several other practices who've done it um and ev- like everyone who's done it it seems seems like it's changed their practice well, it's, for the it, better. it's interesting you say the, the kind of romance and the relationship you have with technology a lot of a lot of the um services like slack or all these apps and stuff they have that kind of exact subscription based well it's a subscription based but it, it often comes in different tiers of of how much of the features that you want to have available to them so can you explain how how your banding works how what do you call it how does it so we have um, a basic uh a standard enhanced and premium um and the premium involves virtual reality uh, the enhanced has kind of 3d um, a standard is this kind of fairly bare bones kind of um, just the kind of 2D drawings and then basic is really very basic but it's, it almost represents what maybe a, an architectural technician would do or something which we were finding we were competing against right. sometimes so we've almost got it in there just to show that we could do that really pared down service if that's really what someone wanted but don't you want all these other things and um so we very rarely actually do the basic service because generally people are coming to us because they want they want they want those 3D 
aspects of the board. Right, so the, the, the more premium uh, bandings are, tend to be more popular. Than yeah, mo- most people go on either enhanced or the premium. And, um, um, but it, what it does actually is it really generates more conversations with the clients mm. because they, they're asking what the difference is. We also do very long lists of deliverables of everything we're going to do and then have tick boxes um, next to which ones belong in which service. Um, and we've actually found it's dr- dramatically reduced the amount of disputes we have with clients over whether we've reached the end of a stage or no, whether we kind of um, need any other meetings and things because we're being very explicit about what we're going to pr- provide. So it's not uh, a kind of customizable tick box where, where clients have got hundreds of decisions and they're kind of trying to pick out which one. The, the bandings have already kind of clearly preset yeah and we've already kind of yeah we have tried it in the past of have people being able to pick and choose um one of the things that's the other really good thing about the banding in the office is that for the architects working on a project before you might put more time into one project rather than another right but it wasn't really transparent as to why we were doing that it maybe wasn't even very intentional like just so, and actually this enables us a bit more to say actually we're not going to do a 3d image on here because we're not being paid for it whereas on this one we are because we're getting paid for it yeah are you more polite to like the premium ones <laughs> <laughs> well no I, I, well i think it's quite quite basically, the op- basically just a handshake <laughs> <laughs> i think it's quite the opposite because everyone knows every, everyone knows where they are yeah and so you don't you don't often coffee you don't have to hide you yeah yeah but <laughs> <laughs> we get the coffee but not the milk <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. d- do you find it helps as well for clients to you know because you're actually giving them i mean one of the reasons why clients often will go to lots of different architects or builders for that matter is because they need some kind of price contrast so here you're actually giving them the price contrast right then and there do you find that it kind of it even stops them from looking at other architects. I th- yeah, I think that is. I think that is true. I mean, that's a very. That's one of, in the theory, mm. the more general theory behind that banding, is very much that idea. Yeah. So if you go to the AA, if they've got three different price brackets, you go, oh well, I'll. You you feel like you've got the choice there and then, even though you're only dealing with one company. Right. And so I think there. I think that is a it, that is a possibility. I think more, more than anything, though, I think it. It it encourages a conversation where you're talking about more than just price. Mm. You're talking about the value and the deliverables that you're going to be provide because you have to start talking about that. And I think that's a really positive thing for everyone involved. And that's why I think it's really good. Mm. And so you could say, what if all architects charged used that trick, as it were? But then I think um, what that would mean is that the client would just have lots of different options where the only way they'd really be able to work out which is the best is by actually reading what they were going to have delivered mm. and then looking at the quality of the work that that architect did. Mm. So it kind of encourages, I think it encourages kind of a, a better service and a yeah, better design, which which can only be a good thing. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk about some of the other ventures that you're involved in, such as um, the live, Lived In project yep. and, um, and also uh, the, the kind of the other partners, the, some of the plot finding services that you've been developing as well. Yeah, so about, uh, I don't know, it's probably about five years ago we were looking at getting into, um, well, we bought a house with a big garden <laughs> Um, or we look as a practice we were kind of looking a, a property came up and we thought well, why don't we get into property development um, and I think Tom was uh, thinking of selling his house and using that money to kind of buy this property which we then did up did up the this house in the garden the other Tom, Tom yeah Howard. Tom Howard um, and so we kind of started think, thinking about thinking about that and then thought well how can we make this a bit worried that that was going to create an inequality between the two of us mm. as directors um, because really he, he'd be investing all the money but the practice would be investing the time right and so we started looking and thinking well how can we make this so that there's still an equality um, there um, and so then we um, had a thing of setting up basically like an investment company a project management company the investment company would buy the land and the project management company would manage it on behalf of the investment company um, and and take a, take some money for providing that service 
And then we thought, well, actually, um, do we need to build the houses? Why don't we just sell the houses to the end users? Because we were finding when we started to think about building them, we started to think of where we could make all the cost savings, yeah. which is what a developer does. Yes. And um, I'm really trying to anticipate what the different purchasers were going to want from the house. Well, so it, it, it's, it's quite an interesting uh, proposition that you, ne- you weren't necessarily the ones that wanted to design the plots yourselves or that you opened up a dub- another different conversation. What was the, the driver behind Miller Howard not necessarily being the only company that was going to be involved in the delivery or the design of the, of the plots? Well, so we started out right at the beginning thinking we'd buy, we'd buy a plot of land and we'd develop the house. And then we thought, well, actually, why don't we not develop the house? Why don't we just sell, a, buy the land and then sell the plots to self-builders? And yeah. They could then develop the plots. And then we eventually thought, well, do we even need to buy the land? Couldn't we just persuade other landowners to sell their land to self-builders um, and just help help them do that process? Um and then we thought, well, do we even need to be doing <laughs> the design work? <laughs> um, perhaps we could have other kind of architects working on the design. Thinking like as well. an entrepreneur now. <laughs> and I suppose all of this is thinking about scale. Yeah. And like, how how can we do a hundred thousand of these a year? Kind of uh, that, that kind of scale of things. Oh, 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 and what, where did that thinking come from? Because that's not necessarily what architects tend to. I, I, I tell you about. where it actually came from a, a bit is one of the guerrilla tactics um, at the RIBA, the right. guerrilla tactics conference, and they had a really good one a couple of years ago that was about platform business models. Right. And I think there I kind of really suddenly kind of saw that opportunity for thinking in a slightly bigger way, mm. um, which takes, it's quite an interesting thing, especially for architects who tend to be quite control freaks <laughs> in kind of wanting to maintain control of everything to... Mm think about how much you can allow others to do in a, in a situation. And I've actually found that really empowering. So on the project we've been working on in Norfolk, um, Project Orange, um, well, actually, we tendered out for architects. So lived in our sister company, ran the tender, and Miller Howard Workshop actually uh, tendered to do those services, but we didn't actually win the tender Project Orange did, which was great, and we've been working with them, and they've done a really great job. And how um, did you? Because that's an interesting scenario to be in. To have um, you, you were making the final decisions on the bids, or how was that process being done? And how did you? Well, we had to try and make it as fair and objective yeah. as possible. Ultimately, the landowner had the ultimate say, and we set out a very clear scoring criteria, and then tried to be as objective right. as we could. Um, I, I mean, I think, to be honest, we were interested in working, seeing how that could work with another mm. architect as well. Um, so it was... And um, um, what did you learn from being on that side of the table, working with other architects? It, oh, it's interesting how quickly you flip. <laughs> <laughs> you flip to kind of seeing everything that you think the clients are... Um, so that thing of, I, I, I don't know, feeling that they're working towards a kind of um, an image in a magazine mm. or a kind of like, uh, not that that's what happened yeah. in that case, but you're suddenly a lot much more aware of those things that the clients, the client anxieties mm. that, that, that they have. Um, I think it was also... It wasn't always kind of totally straightforward relationship because obviously we're we're kind of an experienced client and had views ourselves. But actually, I think that was a really good process in the end, and there was a really great creative tension between the two companies. And I think the end result is kind of really testament to that. And is really great. And has this evolved now into the the app platform that you're developing? Can you speak a bit about that? Yeah. So, well, I suppose we're. I suppose we're just interested in making more of this happen Mm. and trying to work out how to connect all the different people in the process. And I think ultimately what we'd like to do is um, create a website where landowners can meet um, architects or we're kind of toying with the idea of almost like a self-build coordinator who would, who would generally architects would make really good, uh, would be really good at that role. And so I suppose it's providing the architect service, but a few additional things um, really to do with project management or uh, 
I suppose you call it a development manager or a development manager, taking mm. on some of those development manager roles. And then the, I think the other thing is the idea that architects feel like architects don't always share enough. And so the idea of creating a place where architects can share their learning from that um, and basically improve the way houses are built in the UK. Because kind of it, I think a majority of houses in the UK are just so crap. Mm. And it just feels like a lot of other industries have really worked out how to provide a kind of more consistent, better service. And I think in the house building industry, we still feel like we're stuck in the 70s. Mm. And so I think what do you think are some of the big... I mean, it was in, interesting, a couple of things here. Um, we were talking earlier about how that culture of sharing ideas, like in the world of technology and coders, and you were discussing, was it GitHub? GitHub, yeah. GitHub, this kind of platform where you're able to... Um, copy and cut and you know download other people's bits of code which is kind of you know that's that's how you code like you kind of but architects we would never dream of sharing details or piece or bits like that necessarily that like, or so sort of openly do you think that is uh like what are your thoughts around that and the kind of constraints that it brings or i think it's interesting i think it's cultural Mm. Like, and I think it's just in, we haven't had a way in the architectural culture to share things between different practices, like historically. Mm. And those tools now are available, but culturally we're not used to it. Whereas, say, in the software industry, they've just grown up with that ability and that culture. Yeah. And it's amazing to watch. And I've been getting into coding a little bit recently and speaking to coders, they kind of can't believe that architects don't share their design like say a standard damp proof course detail the amount of standard damp proof course details that must be drawn every day in architects offices and then sometimes they're not even shared within the office yeah. <laughs> sometimes even in the same office people are drawing the same detail again and again um, and so I, I mean I think there's a fantastic potential there to sh be sharing more of that but I don't think we have the tools or the culture to do that but I think architects are I think we have sharing and a kind of decency in our mm. kind of DNA. We're not driven by as much as some industries by kind it, of finance. It, it, this, this, the kind of, kind of the counter argument to the sharing culture. Is there a danger that we end up giving away our sort of intellectual property, or we're giving away, you know, our things to not necessarily other architects, because there's always a sort of, I mean, a brotherhood, if you like, of you know, I've, I've spoken to other architects about how they've detailed something and they're always happy to, you know, show me how something's gone together. But what about <laughs> other industries or um, other sort of competing trades that we're working against? That are, are we in danger then of kind of giving something away? I think, I think the interesting thing is you have to work out where your true value lies. And if you're trying to protect something that isn't real value then you're just being protectionist mm. whereas there's almost a, something quite freeing in saying all these things just have because they're you know that's not where our true value lies our true value lies in the ability to problem solve a very specific scenario and apply those more general things to that very specific scenario mm. and i think almost by being explicit about that Ironically, it might kind of actually make people value architects more mm. because you realise if you download all those details without that expert knowledge, you don't know how to apply them. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.